This is The Intervention by Kim Newman. A man he didn't know sat quietly at the far end of the long table. He didn't pay him any attention. Vince, his partner, had asked him to step into the conference room for a moment. The other crisis gave Keith and Vince an excuse to get their brains dirty and demonstrate their continuing, if slightly soft in the middle, whiz kid status to the youngsters they'd employed when the business expanded. This is Mr. Leach, said Vince, nodding at the stranger. Keith looked at Leach and back at Vince. When his eyes weren't on the man, Keith couldn't picture him. He looked back again, almost rudely, staring. Leach was ordinary, of no particular age, reasonably dressed. Keith, tr Keith tried to memorize features, but his mind slid off the face. It's like trying to pick up a paper clip with mittened fingers. What he did notice was that this was not a normal crisis talk through. Vince didn't have a terminal running, surrounded by post-it notes and an open file of spec sheets. He wasn't wearing the lucky hat he always put on for real work. His hair was backcombed over his bald spot. He wore his smart first meeting with clients jacket. Was Leach a new client? Vince didn't arrange first meetings without consulting him. Even if a prospect had come up suddenly, Keith would have been filled in before Leach appeared in the office. Details niggled. Vince's avoidance of him this morning. His excuse for ducking out of the regular lunch. It wasn't just Vince. Rowena, his wife, had been different at breakfast. Even the kids, Jennifer and Jake, they'd all chattered around him as usual. But the talk was brittle with a fine edge of hysteria. Never let up. Questions thrown at him every second, tiny decisions for him to make, pretend problems to keep him occupied. Mary, his PA, had called in sick and stayed away from work. She did not seem to be coming down with anything yesterday. Keith half thought, ev thought everyone was working on something behind his back. He even wondered, non-seriously, if he was about to be on This Is Your Life. Of course, he was too ordinary for that. What was going on? Somehow he couldn't ask the question. Vince didn't ask him to sit down. He wouldn't have anyway. This was Keith's con conference room as much as Vince's. Didn't need to be asked. Something told him to stay standing. Keith Marion, Leach said, confirming, not questioning his identity. This is an intervention. Keith didn't know what the stranger meant. Leach unzipped a leather document folder and opened it like a book. Let the book on This Is Your Life come to that. He produced several white papers in blue plastic folders. He slid them down the table. These are copies, of course, he said. Keith didn't look at the papers. They are consent forms, Leach explained. Would you authenticate the signatures, please? Keith sat down now and slipped the top document out of its blue folder. He turned to the last page and recognized Rowena's scrawl. He skimmed over the many clauses, mind buzzing too much to read. Another form was signed by Vince. There were more, from his, account his accountant, back manager, headmaster of the kids' school, his GP, his parents. This is a radical intervention, Leach clarified. Your rights and responsibilities are suspended. Your bank accounts are frozen for the day. The co will assume responsibility at the opening of trading tomorrow. Commitments will be fulfilled. The business will continue until you are ready to reassume a position. So will your household. Keith looked at Vince, who looked away. Your credit cards are revoked. Codes of all computers you had access to have been changed. Burglar alarms here and at your house have been reprogrammed. You'll please surrender your house, office, and car keys. Leach produced a small plastic bowl. Keith made a fist at his trouser pocket around his keys. Leach held out the bowl and fixed him with his eyes. We can help you best if you don't fight us, he said. Therapy has been authorized by people who care about you. There were two strangers in the room now, a man and a woman, casually dressed. They were between him and the door. Through the glass partition, Keith saw the rest of the office. No one working. Everyone peering at the conference room. Mary was here now, in the reception area, smoking furiously. Keith brought out his keys and dropped them in the bowl. Leach smiled. The first step, he said. Every odyssey begins with the first step. It ends with the last one, Keith snapped. There was a pause. Leach's face shut down, as if not programmed to respond. And he opened his mouth and laughed. The other strangers laughed too. Vince looked away, eyes wet with tears. Your mobile phone? Leach asked. The woman held up Keith's phone. She must have taken it out of his jacket, which was hanging on the back of his swizzle chair in his office. I know this will seem overly harsh, Leach said. You must believe it is done in your interests. 
The man at the door took a pair of shears out of his coat pocket. The woman gave him Keith's mobile, and he snipped it cleanly in two. The snick sound made Keith's heart jump. If you will come with us, Leach said, standing up. Vince took upon himself the task of gathering all the forms and returning them to Leach. Keith shoved his chair away from the table and stood. It's for the best, old son, Vince said. You know that. He knew nothing of the sort. Wasn't stupid enough to say so. The man and the woman were watching him, tensed, waiting for a move. He remembered the heart-punching snick. The woman held open the conference room door. Leach left first. Keith was encouraged to follow. He looked back. Vince didn't meet his eyes. With Leach's associate, associates bringing up the rear, Keith was walk, walked through the office. People he employed, had employed, scurried out of the way, wary of association with him. He didn't know what they'd been told. In reception, he walked past Mary. She was trying to light a fresh cigarette in her mouth while one was still burning between her knuckles. She looked at him, not with shame, but pity. Keith, she said, then nothing. Cold fury kept him calm. He'd go along until there was an opening. Then he'd be away. Some kind of hostile takeover. We'd have to fight back. He was walked outside into the car park they called a courtyard. A white van was parked close by next to his own estranged car. Another man got out of the van and opened the rear doors. Inside, the vehicle was padded like a lunatic's cell. A stretcher was pulled out. Undercarriage descended. If you would take off your clothes and lie down, Leach dictated. Constant will see to them. Constant, the snick man, took a large laundry sack out of the van and held it open. It was a warm day. Faces were pressed to office windows all around the courtyard. Constant held the sack open wide. Long pause. Keith saw the snick in Constant's eyes and unbuckled his belt. Shoes first, I suggest, said Leach. Keith undid his trainers and dropped them in the sack. Good lad, said Constant. Keith undressed and put all his clothes into the sack. He was conscious, standing naked, of the, of the weight he'd gained in his thirties. Constant dropped the sack in a bright orange waist bin. He started a protest. Out with the old, said Leach. It's important. Lie down, please. Keith got onto the stretcher. It was exactly his size. Constant drew a thin sheet over him and then, with the help of the other assistant, swiftly fastened straps over the sheet. It's so you won't hurt yourself, said Leach. We've a long journey. Keith tested the straps. He was held securely. Should have taken his chances with a snick man and made a run for it. Back into the office, out of the street doors, into the crowds. Then what? He apparently had no money, no credit, no car, no business, no home. The stretcher slid back into the van. The roof cut out the sky. The doors were shut and fastened. The strap across his throat prevented him lifting his head more than a few inches. He heard Leach and his assistants get into the fore compartment of the van, felt the engine turn over. The windows in the back of the van were opaque, white plastic, letting in light but no information. Grattan, the attendant, sat out of Keith's sight line, Walkman giving out a muted snare drum. The van traveled over roads of differing qualities at various speeds. It got shady, then dark. This afternoon passed into evening. Light was turned on. He shut his eyes against its harshness. His mind raced so fast at the beginning, at the beginning that he lost the sense of time. Hours had passed didn't know in which direction he was being driven. Why had they done this to him? Was Roe having an affair with Vince? Were his wife and partner scheming to oust him? It seemed more extensive than that, as if everyone he knew were in on the game. That is, kid's signatures in crayon. Who was Leech? But now he couldn't remember the man's face. Nearly there, sunshine, said Grattan. The attendant leaned over into Keith's field of vision and checked him. Is that an earring? Grattan asked, pitching his, his lobe. Keith nodded. Got his ears pierced last year when Jennifer had hers done. She'd wanted to do her nose, but he'd put his foot down. Grattan gently took out his stud and palmed it. All for the best, mate, he said. The van parked and the engine shut off. Quiet was unnerving after the lull and grind of the engine. The doors were wrenched open. He smelled the country, damp, vegetable, earthy. Could be Cornwall or Wales or depending on how late at night it was, Yorkshire. If it were Scotland, night would have passed and it would be the next day. The stretcher was pulled out of the van. He saw sharp points of light in the black of the sky. Away from town, the stars were brighter. Good trip, Keith? asked Leach. Keith turned his head and didn't reply. Leach stood by the van looking over a clipboard. We're far from the madding crowd out here, said Leach. A lot of therapy is getting away from it all. 
Sounds like old hat, but you'll be surprised how effective it can be. Everything put into perspective. Things seem clearer. He indicated the stars. Keith felt cold. Let's go inside, shall we? Leach said, as if Keith had a choice. It's a homey old place. Beyond the van was a house, set in its own grounds, but not a mansion. The trees grew close to the walls, which were buckled a bit by thrusting roots. A fluorescent globe light shone over the front doorway. The house was at the end of a gravel driveway. Keith was carried by Grattan and Constant, who were careful not to let the undercarriage casters of the stretcher sink into the gravel. He looked left and right. A thin row of dark trees lined one side of the drive. Long, low, prefab-looking building was on the other, like a factory or college annex. The stretcher was slid up a ramp placed on the front steps, and the woman, Heather, opened the doors. The attendants set the stretcher down. Leach himself unbuckled the straps. Keith could have gone for his throat. Maybe that was the test. If he so much as flinched, tasers would come out and he'd be zapped unconscious. He needed to pee, and he was shivering. We'll get you something to wear, said Heather. Keith sat up. It was in the hallway of what felt like a small hotel. Corkboard hung on one wall, opposite a mirror in an ugly old frame. Heather helped him off the stretcher. He hugged his sheet to him. He was led into a small sitting room where an imitation log electric fire was on. Heather opened a drawer in an old chest and gave him a pair of off-white woolly socks, drawstring-waisted tracksuit bottom, a yellow pajama jacket, and a mouse-colored dressing gown without a cord. She turned away as he got dressed. The clothes had a hospital feel to them, soft as if washed too many times, slightly stale. There, she said, looking at him, aren't you handsome? It was something you'd say to a child or a very old person. It wasn't meant. Leach looked in. He approved of Keith's clothes. Early to bed with no supper, I'm afraid, he said. There'll be breakfast tomorrow. Then we can start. Keith was led upstairs to a dormitory room with six beds, all empty. We're not too busy now, said Heather. All the better for you. You'll have all of us to yourself, working on your behalf. He was laid down on a bed professionally. Let me see your hands, Heather said. He showed her his manicured nails. She smiled and clipped a plastic noose around one wrist. It ratcheted tight and connected to the bed rail. The bed, he now realized, was bolted to the floorboards. Just to be extra safe, Heather said. She turned out the lights and left the room. He still needed to pee. He wasn't tired enough to sleep. He wanted to shout. He pulled the plastic cuff, testing it. He could get a foot or so of play in the line, but that cinched the noose into his wrist. Once notched up, it couldn't loosen. He could roll off the bed and did. That pulled loose the sheets and blanket. He hadn't slept under anything but a duvet in years, exposed himself to a wicked draft. The room was dark. He could feel under the bed. He found a plastic beaker, about a liter size, lowered his tracksuit bottom one-handed, peed noisily into the container. Then he rearranged himself, tried to get the bedclothes straight. He lost the top sheet and found scrawny blanket against his face and hands. He didn't think he slept, but between one blink and the next, it was light in the room. He was woken by a snick that gave him a panic spasm. Constance stood over him with his shears. Keith could move his arm and realized Constant had cut the plastic tie. Constant snicked the air. She eat the cooked breakfast? It might be drugged. I wouldn't let that go to waste, mate, said Grattan. Keith looked down at the plate, full English. He hadn't eaten since yesterday's quick lunch. Hunger was a claw in his stomach. He tucked in. That's lovely. He couldn't remember the last time he'd eaten anything fried. It was one of Rose's health policies. His body no longer had a tolerance for grease. The small dining room was attached to a plant-filled conservatory. Keith looked around, itching for something. No papers, I'm afraid, said Grattan, realizing before Keith what it was he was missing. Can't be doing with distractions. Let the outside world roll on by itself. You have to concentrate on your own problem. I don't have any problem. Grattan smiled tolerantly. You're here, aren't you? You must have a problem. Leach stepped into the room wore a white jacket over jeans and a big smile. Keith was suddenly furious. What the hell is this all about? Why the hell am I here? Leach sat down at the table, poured tea from the metal pot, shook a thin sachet of sugar. These are questions you have to ask yourself, Keith. You're a clever man, so you know that you know the answers. But clever people can hide things from themselves. Stupid people can't, you know. They're one great advantage. You think you've been hiding answers from yourself? He genuinely didn't understand the question. That makes no sense. 
Indeed, if you realize that, there's a chink. You're here to make sense of it. Where's here? He poured sugar into his tea. Not important, he said. The mat name wouldn't, me wouldn't mean anything to you. Don't look out, look in. He made fists and held them together against his chest. All the way in, Keith. Keith looked around the room, past Leach's eyes, wondering if there was movement in the conservatory, calculating his chances of making a dash. He looked back at Leach's bland face and pushed back his chair. Beyond the plants, windows were open. He felt a breeze. He stood up, stretched. Good grub, he said, and ran, tipping the table aside. He felt a thump in his side, then real pain. An expert jabbed the kidney. Gratton held him up so he didn't fall. His legs were unstrung. Pain ran up and down the entire right side of his body. Leach still held his teacup. I'm disappointed, Keith, he said. You only hurt yourself by refusing to admit that you have a problem. I thought we were making progress. I see that you were playing the cunning game, hiding in your burrow, squirreling away nuts for the winter. You've let yourself down. And people depend on you, Keith. Love you. Need you. Rowena, Jennifer, Jake, Vincent, Mary, all of them. People you don't even think you know depend on you. Clients, officials, tradesmen, suppliers. They all want only for you to get better, to take your place. This isn't torture, it's therapy. Keith was able to get a footing again. His socks swaddled feet were flat on the tiles. The pain was going. You must understand. Keith didn't say anything. Couldn't bring himself to nod. You must. Another blow in the same spot. He'd have doubled up, but he was held fast. Early days yet, said Leach. Still in the loose clothes he'd been given last night, Keith was escorted out of the house and into the long hut-like building. The windowless space had an old animal smell. Overhead lights fizzed on. The building had no interior walls or partitions. In pools of light, basic furniture was arranged in basic configurations. It was like a rehearsal hall, with rough stage sets laid out. There were people here, mostly gathered at the far end, where there was no light. Heather sat at a kitchen table, opposite an empty folding chair. She wore a dressing gown and took Keith a moment to recognize his rose. He turned to Leach and got no clue. Grattan walked Keith into the scene and sat him down. Keith, Heather said, this can't go on. The kids have noticed. Things have been said at school. Keith looked at the woman as if she were mad. Say something, damn you, she said. She was doing Rowena perfectly. The old accent still there, smoothed out by elocution lessons. Heather touched her hair, an exact row mannerism. You're frightening me, she said. Keith looked back at Leach and Grattan. His side, his side still ached. You're not my wife, he said. Tears started in her eyes. Keith, she remonstrated, almost whining, looking away, making as if to slap the table, then covering her face. But you're not, he protested. The woman began to sob uncontrollably. When Rowena's brother was killed in a car accident, she'd been exactly like this. Then he tried to comfort her, to get close, to make it better. Now he froze. Heather, not Rowena, a stranger, tore her hair, clawed her face, screamed and cried, leaked gummy fluid from her eyes and nose. He folded his arms, cold inside, and watched the act. He couldn't take this anymore. He stood up and turned. This was just a silly game. When Leach and Grattan had been sta where Leach and Grattan had been standing were two smaller people, Jake and Jennifer, not stand-in midgets. Their faces were round with horror, appalled at what they had seen. Daddy, said Jennifer, reaching out. No, said Jake, holding his sister back. Remember, we agreed. Leach was with his children. This is low, Keith said, really low. The woman was still making a scene, collapsing into quieter, exhausted sobs that racked her entire body. This isn't mom, he told his kids. This is make-believe. I'll get you out of here, I promise. I won't let them hurt you. He stepped toward his children. Damn the kidney puncher. He'd take anything for Jake and Jennifer. It wasn't just him in this trap now. He had to protect the kids. He really saw their faces and froze. They were terrified of him. Jennifer broke away from Jake and ran to Leech, burying her face in his jacket. He cuddled and soothed her. Jake held his ground and looked up at Keith, mouth set, defiant. He was white with terror. Dad, don't. Lights went out and came on again. He was in another rough set, conforming to the layout of his office, seated in front of an old, unconnected television set and a manual typewriter. At the edge of the light, Leach watched, taking notes. There were no other actors. 
He's tried to think through the problem. He wanted to call in Vince to hash it all out. They could crack almost anything. He'd heard of these things, interventions. They were for people with serious drug problems, alcoholics, and addicts of self-destructive behavior. Weak people who excuse their bad behavior by blaming it on irresistible compulsion. Randy bastards who call themselves sex addicts. Fat fools who said the devil made them eat too much. Downright crooks who alleged poor toilet training made them steal car radios. Heath was not like that at all. He was just ordinary. He followed Leach's advice and looked in, searching for a reason. Until yesterday, he hadn't had any serious problem. If anything, his life had been well above average. Vince, though it didn't hinder him in the business, was in much worse personal shape, divorced and estranged from his daughter. There were no hiccups in Keith's marriage. He even been secure enough to tell Roe that Mary had a little crush on him. The kids were great, getting on well in school, and terrified of him. And Roe was contemplating going back to work, not just for the money, because she wanted to. Financially, they were set up. No hidden holes in the accounts. No money bleeding out anywhere that he knew of. Imagining images on the dusty screen of the pretend computer, he ran scenarios. Vince was in worse shape than Keith had thought, mixed up with one of his daughter's mad slut friends, spending more and more to keep above water, concealing the drain on the business. Vince knew he'd be, he'd be found out soon, he had set things up so it all seemed to be Keith's fault. His partner, his best friend, had framed him, projecting his own troubles. Did Vince res resent Keith that much? Resent his undivorced wife and unestranged children? Couldn't be true. It could not be true. Leach stepped into the light and sat down on a swivel chair. Let's talk business, he said. Had Vince fooled Leach? Or was the therapist in on it? Keith had to try least worst scenario first. It's not me, it's Vince, he said. Look closely. Who called you in? Who showed you the books? This is a setup, a conspiracy. Qui bono? Leach looked genuinely sad. Keith, 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 listen to yourself. Ask yourself if even you believe yourself. Look at it like the daily crisis. Attack it. Think it through. Keith spent too much time with Vince. There was no space in his partner's life for the scam he'd imagined. If not Vince, someone, he said to Leach. You, maybe. I only want to help you face your problem. I haven't got a fucking problem. How many times do I have to say it? How many times can you say it, Keith? How many times before it sounds as fake in your ears as everyone else's? I haven't got a problem. I haven't got a problem. I haven't... Leach was right. It did sound fake. Clearly Keith had a problem, or he wouldn't be here. It was just that the problem wasn't with Keith. It was with everyone else, said Leach. The whole rest of the world is wrong, and you're right. Hold that up to the light, Keith. Think. Take that step. Admit the problem, and perhaps there's a way past... He heard the unforced sincerity in the man. He was letting them all down, he knew. Somehow, in a way he really couldn't see. But no, he wasn't a boozer, on drugs, a gambling nut, screwing around, abusing his kids, dragging the business down. He just wasn't. He couldn't think of a problem. Leach, I don't know what you want me to say. It's not what I want. This isn't to please me, Keith. In this room, I don't matter. This is your place. What do you want to say? I don't know. Leach smiled with relief. Super, Keith. That's a half step could admit that you don't know. You understand now how difficult that is for someone like you, someone used to knowing. It's all right not to know, to have doubts. It's all right. I'm so proud of you, darling, said a woman. He saw Heather in the freestanding empty frame that represented his office door. No, not Heather. Rowena, face streaked. He tried to stand. Rowena stepped back, dark curtaining her, fa curtaining her face. Not yet, Keith, said Leach. Later. More sets, more scenes. Leach and Heather were his parents, taking him through a rerun of his teenage years, which overlapped with his memory but also contradicted it radically. They talked through his decision to turn down a directorship of the firm he had started with and set up on his own with Vince. Leach stabbing in harsh questions about Vince's reliability far more vehemently, vehemently than Dad actually had done. Then the pair became Jake and Jennifer, nearly dead on in their performances, wearing tailored adult-sized school blazers with overlarge badges to keep the scale. They quizzed him about their own lives and interests. It was a struggle to recall the pop bands and computer games the kids were obsessed with. 
to be rated harshly on his knowledge of trivia that had been a background buzz in his life for the past few years. He thought he knew the names of Jennifer's best friends in order of preference. But things had changed in the playground and he was working from last month's crib sheet. He sat down at a school desk he was uncomfortable with and an elderly woman slapped a piece of paper in front of him. When he turned it over and recognized his geography, old level exam, he realized that the woman was Mrs. Boat, his old form teacher from school. On the desk were a pad of lined paper. Use only one side and leave wide margins. A pen, a plastic ruler, a box of colored pencils. Mrs. Boat invigilated, holding up a stopwatch as he struggled to draw maps and write essays. He hadn't used a fountain pen to write more than a check in decades. Blotches, blotches appeared on his hands in the paper. 25 years ago, he got a B average pass. This was likely to be a washout, a fail. There were no meal breaks. He was not let out of the long hut. The sessions went on and on. Days must have passed, only he got tired. Each and his assistants all remained fresh. He played real games with Constant and Grattan and mostly lost. One-on-one -on -one basketball, arm wrestling, pool, snakes and ladders, dominoes, the mirror game, I spy, risk, Campaign, hopscotch, 20 questions, truth or dare, darts. Heather, as Mary, tried to seduce him in his office while Rowena and the kids watched from chairs outside the circle of light. He resisted, though the woman, surely improvising, became more and more blatant and wanton. After an hour of this, Leach let Rowena and the kids go, assured Keith that this was a time out for them. If he wanted to take advantage of the opportunity, no one would be any the wiser. He also winked. Exhausted, he kissed Heather on the mouth. She slapped him. Leach and his real lawyer, Simon Manfred, took him through the basics of sexual harassment legislation. They read long legal documents aloud, interpolating brand names of household cleaning products somewhere in every sentence, never repeating, always managing to conceal them so that sense was preserved. He found himself listening for Lemon Jiff, Daz, and Purcell, missing what was actually being said, which became more and more serious. Legal complications were set out, which could bring his whole life crashing down and land him in prison. That ended and he was in a sitcom. Rowena and the kids, the real ones, sat around the breakfast table, providing a laugh track as he tried to get through to them. They must have been brainwashed. In the end, he threw the props around, smashing things. His family found this utterly hilarious. He collapsed and slept for maybe 10 seconds. He woke in complete darkness, handcuffed to something with a wiry, hairy arm. It jittered, chittered, leaped, landing on his ribs with a lot of projectile weight. Harry all over it, smelled rank. He was jerked into a sitting position as the thing bounded off. He was dragged across a bare earth floor. The creature screeched and banged his wrist over and over against the ground. Keith lay limp, dreading long fingers that might come for the soft parts of his face. It was all over. They were just going to kill him now. The light came on. Leech was sitting on a milking stool next to him black furred pink-faced animal in his lap stroking and petting and calming keith was handcuffed to some member of the monkey family smaller and more spidery than a chimpanzee this is kiki my spider monkey said leech that made sense keith couldn't believe he'd had that last thought you see the metaphor of course said leech it's not quite literal but if we put kiki on your back you might have been seriously injured she's a strong little thing but you get the point you must be used to this feeling that a part of you is beyond your control, potentially dangerous, potentially frightening, also exciting, entertaining, cute as a button. Can't blame Kiki, and you have to love her, but she's not good for you. No, dearie, you're not. Sorry. You have to say bye-bye to Keith now. There's a good girl. Constance snicked the plastic cuff. Keith had two leftover noose bracelets on his right wrist now. Reached past the spider monkey to Constance, who carried it off. Now, Keith, how would you like some crack cocaine? Keith shuddered. Just joking, said Leach. Time for tea and bickies, though. Keith sat, disassociated, stunned. Around him, everyone had a tea break. Roe rationed two biscuits apiece to Jennifer and Jake, knowing Keith usually slipped them sweets against her program, but not really minding. Grattan and Mary lit up cigarettes and went to the far corner of the hut, where Keith could swear they were flirting. Vince sat as far away as possible, whispering into a mobile phone that hadn't been cut in half. Constant worked at a crossword of a, news, of a newspaper, which was missing its front pages. Leach slurped his urn to candid tea like a connoisseur. 
Other people milled about, some familiar, others not. Going well, isn't it, said Manfred. It's rather fun. Nobody brought Keith any tea. Mrs. Boat came back with his exam paper covered in red ink. Adi, she said. Good thing it was only the mock. You'll do better under real fire. He stared at his essay on Swiss crop rotation, read scribbles on blue blotches. Couldn't see how any of this was helping. Leach finished his tea. Back to work, everyone, he said. Chairs were put in a circle and Keith was love-bombed. Everyone told him how he or she really felt about him, mostly with tears. They all reminisced out loud about the most perfect moments of their relationship. Manfred remembered in convincing detail a weekend of walking in the fell country that Keith could have sworn he and Roe had gone on with Vince and his ex. They all told him when they had started to notice the problem. Nobody said what the problem was. They'd all noticed it. Jennifer haltingly recounted the months during which she had gone from being afraid for to being afraid of, how the nightmares had got out of control. Jake talked about the shame he had felt at school when word got out and his friend's parents told their kids to put distance between themselves and the Marion family. Vince, amazingly reluctant and halting, said the morale of the office was affected. The business might suffer. Leach said nothing, looked at Keith throughout, fixed. Heather kept asking Keith how he felt after each little speech. He felt less and less. The session seemed to go on for hours, days. It was an impossible shift. No one else got tired. A well-dressed man, who turned out to be Keith's tax inspector, ran over the case notes for the last five years, flagging odd slips. Keith had made more errors in their favor than his. Only a few pounds were astray. The man was meticulous. Also boring. Mrs. Boat said Keith had potentially Mrs. Boat said Keith had potential but was easily distracted by extracurricular activities and could do better. Fair only. Mom blamed herself. She admitted that she'd always known but hadn't wanted to face it. But she would stick by him, would see him better. Dad agreed with her. Rose said she had thought about leaving. Finally, Leach spoke. It's a house of cards, Keith, and you've built it. You've developed highly sophisticated systems for dealing with your problem, for hiding from it and behind it. They work and will work for years. It's only a house of cards. It will collapse. The machine will run down. It's up to you. All of us here have taken it as far as we can. We have to hand the weight back to you. There's a lot of love in this circle. It's there for you. But it's not unconditional. You have to reach inside to make a break, to make an admission. Now, is there anything you want to say? Keith was cold inside. He made the words in his mind. I have a problem. He knew the reaction that would get. The gathering around, the tearful hugs, the firm handshakes, the shoulder claps, the restoration of rights and responsibilities. He had no spit in his mouth. His tongue was old leather. He could only creak. The expected eyes were on him. His lips went in and out. I Breaths were held. Could he lie? Could he fool them? No. Firmly, no. He could not lie. He shrugged and sat quiet. The disappointment waves were worse than blows. His family and friends and associates were all too drained to react. They poured out so much, and this wasn't the ending they had yearned for. They bristled, resenting him for not backing down. Leach made a mark on his clipboard. Vince got up and walked away from the circle. Jennifer began to cry softly. Mom and Dad held hands. Rowena looked at him with something close to hatred. You're a strong man, Keith, said Leach. Strong and clever. It's worse for you because of that. You've incorporated the problem into your makeup. You've put up thick walls around yourself. You're in real danger. This place is your last stop before the void. Deep down, you know that. We certainly do. That's no threat, just a statement. Daddy, please, said one of his kids. Come on, mate, get it over with. Keith, Keith, can't be that difficult. Just say it, Marion. Son, out with it. Dad, come on. You could do better. You can do it, Keith. Now, please. Voices from the circle overlapping, rising. His animal wall was dismantled. His stomach was ice. His mind floated far off and clicked back into sharp focus. Okay, all right, he said. I've got a problem. A beat. Quiet. Incipient rapture. Shining faces. He still looked expectant. Keith didn't get it. I admit it, Leech. I, Keith Marion, have a problem. 
Leach nodded. Good, he said. Good. Progress. Breakthrough. Now, Keith, you have a problem. Dead inside, Keith looked at the therapist. So, Keith, said Leach, what are you going to do about it?